Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the session about that, that, that talks about uh, building a publishing platform on Drupal 8. Um, this is a beginner session. I won't go into like very deep technical details. I will explain why we decided for Drupal 8. I will explain how we approach the project. Um, I will explain which contrib modules we use. And uh, I will try to do a bit of demo. We'll see how that works. Um, and uh, of course, if you will have any questions that are like more technical, feel free to ask. Um, my name is Janes. Um, I'm slash RSM on Drupal.org and all the other internet thingies. Um, okay. Um, so you might heard of me in relation to media in Drupal, especially in Drupal 8. I'm an active contributor, and uh, I'm trying to do my best to improve media for Drupal 8. Um, and since this is a publishing platform, of course, we had to deal with media too. So I was able to do some of my Drupal 8 media work as part of this project. And I will also explain a few things related to that. Um, I work remotely from Slovenia um, for a company called examiner.com, which is in Denver, US. Um, I generally like remote work a lot. Uh, I sometimes also do like a little bit of kind of digital nomadism, um, and I think it's great. And uh, I would really recommend if you're interested in remote work and how to approach it and... Uh, why your fears about remote work are not real, <laughs> try to read this book, Remote Office Not Required. Um, it was written by guys from 37 Signals, a uh, company that basically built Basecamp. Uh, they're fully remote, and uh, they, uh, they, they developed some very nice techniques. I have three gorgeous girls that are sometimes not that gorgeous, especially at 5 a.m. in the morning on Saturday when they want to wake up. Um, I like to travel to nice places, but I also like to travel to not so nice places because all that inspires us. I uh, like to do silly things sometimes and also like to do silly things with my friends. And uh, I often think too much about problems that I can't really solve, so, but well, I can't help it. Um, as I already mentioned, I work for Examiner, um, and uh, who have heard about examiner.com in this room? Well, quite a lot, because Examiner was quite a buzz when Drupal 7 was released, or even before that, and now it's kind of shaded away. So basically, it was one of the first Drupal 7 websites. Um, I wasn't with them back then. I joined later. Um, they launched it on, I think it was alpha something. It was pretty early in the release cycle. Um, and it, it used to be, until recently, probably the biggest website in terms of traffic and content. We get like 50 million page views a month. Um, we have around 10,000 active examiners. These are people that write our content. Um, we create around 3,000 new nodes every day. We have 3 million terms and 40 million nodes. Um, whoops. So we have 10,000 examiners. We don't employ all these people. We are based on like kind of freelance model. Like anybody can can apply to write for examiner. They will go through go through a review process, and then they will get a, a topic that they write for assigned to them, and then they can write 
anytime they want. And then there is like some kind of profit sharing model, and that's how they earn their money. Um, so we don't have in-house writers. We have to deal with people that we cannot train, basically. And a lot of times they are also not very technically capable. Um, so content creation needs to be as simple, as, as lean as possible. Um, around two years ago, we were bought by a company called AEG. It's a Los Angeles-based corporation that is uh, heavily involved in the entertainment business. For example, they own, or partly own, LA Kings. Uh, they own Staples Center and LA Live area. It's where DrupalCon Los Angeles was held. Uh, they manage musicians, like Michael Jackson was managed by them. They hired a doctor. Um, and we became part of a company called Access, which was part of AG, it's not anymore, um, which is basically a ticket sales company. Like, oh, they, 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 their business is selling tickets for events online. Um, and the reason why they merged us is that they wanted to use our content to drive sales on their side. And since examiner.com is quite, uh, we're quite powerful when it comes to celebrities and entertainment, music, things like that. It means, this, the fact that we do this, it means that we are a very good fit for somebody who sells tickets for music events, for example. Um, and uh, the problem was that examiner was never, never designed to do that. It was designed to deliver content to millions of users um, and just display the content that is created on its own site. Um, and since we have quite a lot of traffic, we always had to optimize for performance of delivery. Sometimes we have to accept drawbacks in other areas just to make sure that everything runs fast and smooth. Um, we did improve the content creation part quite a lot through the years, but it's not perfect, partly also due to the fact that you know, we, our first priority is something else. Um, but also, like, the fact that we had to send content to Access now, it meant that we are having content types that are not directly displayed on the actual examiner, which was kind of hacky, because, as I said, Examiner was not designed to do that. Um, so, yeah, that was the story. Give us content for access, and uh, great content experience for everybody, and by the way, you also have to make sure that Examiner still works, and then, well, since you can send content to access, we will now make another website, and you will send content to that website too, and we did it. And we said, well, okay, now it's done. Uh, we don't have to add any more sites. And then management came and said, oh, and another site, please. And another, oh, and we would like to have this gaming website. And we were like, shit. <laughs> so this is the point where Project Shakespeare was born. This is a fancy name invented by our management. We call it Pop Tool. <laughs> Um, so, what were the requirements? Um, Paptool needs to handle creation of content for many different destinations. Um, has to support varying delivery methods, like it has to support push model, it has to support pull model, it has to support JSON, it has to support XML, all that. Um, it has to support assignment management. Like, an examiner, people can write whatever they want, basically. And if it's not, like, hate speech or anything like that, we won't basically touch it. If it's reported that it's something wrong with it, then we remove it, of course. But with access, where, um, where 
where we basically need to deliver content that is needed at that very moment. Let's say report of Roger Waters concert in San Francisco yesterday. Um, writers can't just write about anything, so we have to handle this workflow somehow. Editors create an assignment, and then writers can claim this assignment and write content for it, and then we have some review process, and, and when a like, piece of content looks okay, it's pushed over to, to the destination site. Um, also scheduling, like we need to schedule. Um, we either want to publish something as soon as it's ready, or we want to schedule it to, for, to be published a little bit later. Um, we need to have progress tracking, review workflow, um, and notifications and feedback as part of our review for workflow. And as I said, yeah, we went with Drupal 8. Um, why did we decide to do so? First reason was timeline. Um, so we started planning this project in mid 2014, and uh, late 2014 we finally decided for D8. Um, I think the Drupal 8 was already in beta at that time. Um, it was like kind of stable; it wasn't changing that much. At least we thought it won't. Um, and um, also the fact that deadline was not strict um, helped us with this decision because there was a lot of unknowns with with D8. Um, so what what were most obvious arguments for Drupal 8? Uh, first is config management. It's much, 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 much nicer than features in D7. Um, then the fact that we already have REST built into it, because like, we need to deliver content and we use services for that, so uh, we don't need to rely on contrib solution for that, because it's in core. Um, the fact that it's built with contemporary patterns, it's not like eight years old technology. Um, we will have a longer lifespan when project is live. Um, we felt that we were capable of doing that because we, in the team, we had at least three developers that actually co contributed to Drupal 8 one way or another even before that. Um, and uh, it's fun for technical team, actually. Uh, it's also a nice tool to keep your developers from escaping your company because there was not a lot of D8 projects um, in late 2014, and uh, we all wanted to play with it. So, main reason, because it's cool. <laughs> Why would we decide for Drupal 7? Um, there is a lot of contrib available that it's maybe not available for D8. Um, we basically needed to re relearn the Drupal again, more or less. Um, people were comfortable with D7, and some people, especially, well, some people not, don't, don't necessarily like to learn that much. Well, I, I always say that if you don't want to learn, you probably have to leave the industry, but still, some people want to avoid that. And um, with Drupal 8, we had a lot of unknowns, because... Uh, there's a lot of knowledge in the community in general about Drupal 7, but for Drupal 8, yeah, everything looks nice, but you know, things can get um, interesting when we try it for real. And we also had one developer that says, oh, oh, sucks. So I don't want to touch Drupal 8 because it's object-oriented. I like Drupal 7. And he still says that. Uh, luckily, he's more on the infrastructure side, so he actually doesn't touch it a lot. <laughs> so, no objective reasons, right? And then we said, okay, let's do it. How did we approach the project? First, we started with uh, gathering requirements. Um, it was basically done in a series of meetings with business and content editorial team. Um, we created a list of very general user stories. Um, so at the end, we ended up with a Google document that was separated in different sections, like 
assignments, um, client handling, uh, content creation, and so on. And we had very general um, user stories in there. Um, when we started working on, 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 on actual coding, we started splitting these general user stories into more concrete ones. Um, we used Scrum. It's part of our culture already. Um, we have two-week time boxes. Um, but initially, we weren't sticking to it like very strictly because at the beginning, we had to do a lot of back-end development of, of, of basic like subsystems, and it was more like cowboy development, but um, we had still tried to stick to these two weeks time frames and at least try to plan what will be done as part of um, this time box. But, but later in the, in the cycle, when things became more visible, when uh, smaller tasks were possible, then we like, came back to the real scrum that we do every day also with other projects. Um, we always do peer reviews. This is also part of our culture. Every piece of code that is developed will first go into review and then maybe go back and forth and back and forth. And there is always just one person that is release manager for Timebox. And this is the only person that merges code into the main branch, which means that you have at least three, set of, three pairs of eyes that see the code before it's merged. And this this way, we already prevented quite a lot of problems. and It works very well for us. Uh, it doesn't take too much time. Um, when you get used to it, I think it goes pretty fast and smoothly. Um, and we use GitHub pull request workflow. Um, so we do reviews on there. And we also review all the contrib modules and all the core upgrades. Like there is not a single piece of code that goes live on Examiner without going through this process. So initially we did like very low level backend development as I already mentioned. Um, we created our own install profile so we have like kind of distribution. Um, created a lot of custom entity types which is very easily done in Drupal 8, much easier than Drupal 7. It's great. Thank you, Fago, and others. Um, we were also testing it automatically and manually from the very beginning. Uh, we use BHAT um, to do automated tests, and we have uh, one person that does manual Q&A, QA. Um, this was the first project where we used automated tests, so it was a very nice learning experience. Um, we also integrated it with GitHub, so each pull request that, that is created will be like take, fetched by Jenkins, and then Jenkins will run the tests on that code, and if anything fails, then you see that red message and cross, and it's all, ah. and then when you fix it, you have nice green uh, hello message that, that makes you happy. Um, who can guess what this is? No. Sorry? No. GitHub, yes. Why don't GitHub? It's, it's a pull request. It is a list of commits in uh, one of the pull requests. Can anybody try to figure out what kind of pull request would have that many commits? Mm. Upstream of what? Maybe Drupal? Yeah. So Drupal was a moving target. Um, I actually tried to do this with the actual diff of this pull request. Of this pull request. It would be just one line. Like, it was so long. Uh, so yeah, Drupal 8 was moving target, of course, um, and we needed to chase it somehow. And how we approached this was, we said, like, every Wednesday is Drupal Core Merge Wednesday. 
So every Wednesday, we merge what was done in core in the last week. And then we do peer review on this code. Um, we run tests. Uh, we give it a sanity check. And then we merge it if everything is OK to this point. And then our QA person will do regression as part of regular testing. Um, so first thing that reviewing so big pull requests, it's not easy. And we approached it in a way that we basically went through commit messages of every commit. And it, if it was dealing with documentation or tests or parts of Drupal core that we didn't use, we said, OK, this is probably not breaking anything. If commit was about something that we used, then we actually reviewed that commit. Um, and this was done by the person that did the merge and peer reviewer. Um, Sometimes things broke, of course, um, but it wasn't that bad. Like, I really expected that we would spend days doing this, but it was usually done in an hour. Um, the worst time, actually, was two weeks before first release candidate. It seemed that everybody wanted to put everything in, and it was awful. Like, those two weeks, that one of the, I think the last... The last merge before RC1 took us four days, I think. Um, and we could, we were able to do this because we were, we are reinstalling, we were reinstalling the project over and over again. Like if we would already be in production, then this would be much harder to do. Um, so we, we, we did code-driven development with install profile and feature modules, and configuration is stored in feature modules depending where it makes sense to be. Um, so it's kind of like similar to code-driven development in V7. Um, and then... No, no, just a regular module, and we put any glue code or any custom code that belongs there and default configuration in config folder, config install. Um, then when, when things actually started to come together, Timers kicked in. Um, our culture is every, every ticket that we work on, um, it, it, if it is that kind of a ticket that it requires back-end and front-end work. Um, it's first done by back-ender, usually, because that's a requirement. And then it's assigned to front-end person, which does their job, and then everything is merged together to the main branch. Um, here, it was also, at the beginning, it was a bit different, because initial theming was quite time consuming, so that took like probably one month or something like that, because we were also working on other projects during that time. Um, but then later, uh, we also switched back to this workflow. Um, we have custom team based on Bootstrap, um, and usually, this is also usually how we work. If front-enders run into any problems, then they communicate with backenders, and we try to support them and give them what they need. Now we are in phase in of user testing. Um, our internal people and few of the examiners are testing it, and um, we are we're planning to release it, like probably in a, a, a by the end of the year it should be there. Um, First, we will deliver content to Rowdy. This is the second website that I mentioned at the beginning. It's a country music site. Um, then we will add access, and then we will slowly continue adding other, other destinations, because uh, it will be much easier than to do like switch on day one and put everything there. Um, and the reason that we decided for Rowdy to be first is that uh, it has the lowest number of contributors, which means it would be easier for us to, to 
get like bug, bug reports and, and, and it will be easier to communicate and get initial feedback. Um, so which contrib modules are we using? Um, we use Media Entity with all its friends, its storage component for media in Drupal 8. Um, we, we bring Twitter tweets into the system using that. Uh, we handle like regular, regular local media. Uh, we integrate Instagram, um, uh, slideshows, and all that. Um, we use inline entity form a lot. Um, it turns out that it's not only useful for commerce, but it's also very useful for media because you have a lot of very simple use cases. And uh, this is one of the examples that I believe really show why this approach that we took for media in D8, decoupling it into smaller independent components that can work with any entity type, not just media, it's very powerful because this way we can collaborate with other parts of the community. Um, then we use Entity Browser. It's one of the components in media initiative, in media ecosystem in D8. It's a browsing and selecting tool for entities. For example, if you have a, a entity reference field, you can use Entity Browser to either upload your images or to search through the existing library and pick images from there. Or you can use it also for related content. You can search nodes and pick few articles that are related to the article that you are currently working on. Uh, then we also use relation. Are you familiar with the relation module? Um, we use it uh, uh, in the assignment part. So when assignment is created and user claims an assignment, we create a relation. And then when content is created, we also relate to that node within the same relation. Uh, it's very nice from like the architectural point of view, but it can become pretty complicated when you try to query that. Like building views on top of that can be very, very hard. Because um, we we needed few fields on the actual relation, and uh, the fact that we were able to to reference three things from one relation, so it's powerful. Um, as I said, we use Bootstrap um, as a base team. Uh, it actually turned out that it was not the best decision, though. <laughs> if we would, to do this decision again, we would go with totally custom team, because we, I guess, had more problems with Bootstrap than benefits. Um, and we basically contributed to each of these projects, um, especially in projects from media ecosystem. We basically did initial development as part of this project. Um, and we're always trying to, if there is, we're working on something and there is a way to to make it so it will be useful for others, either by contributing to another module or creating a module and publishing it, publishing it out there, um, we will try to do so. We try to do as little custom code as possible. Um, we also have some other modules. It's like scheduler. We created a terms of service module where you create terms of service and then every time you, when you update it, it will block access, it, it can block access to some parts of the site until user comes and accepts terms of service. Um, and I, I actually thought that this is published on Drupal.org already, but today I realized I forgot to do that. So I, 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 will, I will publish it. Yeah. Uh, then we, Primoz created, Primoz, raise your hand. Primoz created RobZone.js integration module. Um, have you heard about DropZone? Yeah. It's a nice multi-upload. <laughs> Christoph heard about it because <laughs> I told him half an hour ago. <laughs> um, it's a nice multi-upload tool 
It's HTML5 based, so it's very nicely teamable. Um, and this module gives you the form element which you, which you can use on, on your own custom forms. And it also creates entity browser widgets, so you can use it in entity browser to upload images. Uh, we use hash wrapper. Um, have you heard about hash wrapper? Hash wrapper is a very nice module. If you have a lot of files, and there were situations in the past where sites went down because they had tens of millions of files in one folder, hash wrapper will, pre will prevent that. It basically creates a hash of a file, and then it renames the file to this hash. So it, like if you have my image.jpg, it will be like .jpg. And it takes first four characters of the hash string to create two folders. So first folder are, is named after first two characters, and second level it's named after second two characters. And this spreads files evenly across the file system, and you completely prevent, prevent this problem. It's nice. Um, I think Chicks wrote it, but I'm not sure. Um, and we also use the Valen Composer Manager. So, now it's demo time. <laughs> do, do you have any questions? Um, so, our team is nine people. We are three backenders, uh, one manager slash infrastructure guy, um, currently two front-enders, one person this, that is like on both sides, so we move it where it's needed, and QA person. But not the entire team was working on this project all the time. Like when we started, uh, basically Primoz and myself worked on it alone for half a year, and even that was not full-time. I guess I probably did it almost full-time, but you didn't, right? Did you work on Rowdy? No. On an examiner? So it was full time too. Okay. And then when teaming kicked in, it was initially like half of a person. And then we hired Dragon. He's also here. Um, so now we can breathe like a little bit more normal. <laughs> well, he likes to drive his motorbike. <laughs> okay. Okay. I feel like in a parliament. So, this is Pabto. It's my local install. Uh, first, I will show you how to create an assignment. So, now I logged in as an editor. And as you can see... Uh, they can do a lot of different things. They can create projects. Um, project is kind of a group of assignments, I guess. Is this an accurate description, pretty much? Like, yeah, it's a group of assignments. Like then. Um, then you can manage them. You can create style guides. It's basically a PDF, a PDF file that you upload, uh, and then you can attach style guide to an assignment, so it explains how content should look. Um, they can manage assignments, and they have review queue. Uh, content that is created comes here. So let's create an assignment. Um, you can give it, like, of course, you have to give it a name. Um, like, write report from DCVN. Okay, you see that I tried it already today. <laughs> uh, then you can um, decide which project this belongs to. 
Um, we will put it in general Rowdy stories, so it will be content that will be pushed to Rowdy at some point. Then you write a description where you basically explain what it's needed. Then we have status. Um, it's uh, uh, well, of course, if if it's inactive, then you, you, your contributors won't be able to claim it. If it's active, it's claimable. And what is suggested, I will show you a little bit later, because it's very interesting and it uses part of Drupal eight that is new. Um, and it's very powerful. Then you can set the deadline. Um, you can also set uh, submission limits, which basically means how many content items can be created for this assignment. And you can also limit how many content items can each individual contributor write. So let's say we need 100 articles, and each contributor can write at most three. Uh, we can also define, by default, each assignment will be claimable by every contributor that is assigned to this specific client. Client, in our case, is Rowdy, like Rowdy website. But if you want to limit that selection, you can, you can enter users here. It's normal entity reference field. And then only those users that are, that are listed here in this field will be able to see it and to claim it. Then you can also attach style, style guide and define language. And you can also uh, decide which workflow the assignment is using. Uh, workflow is basically a series of steps. And they need to be created beforehand. And each client can have more workflows for different kinds of assignments. Uh, and you can set notification level. And we save that. Um, and we see that it was created. Uh, and this says that I cannot claim it because I'm not contributor for this client. Um, I am editor at the moment, but I'm not contributor. This doesn't mean that editors cannot have permissions to contribute. But in this specific case, I don't have these permissions, so editor is not able to write for its own company. OK, now I will log out. And I will log in as a contributor. Um, and if I go to the assignments tab, so this is dashboard. Uh, your assignments will uh, appear here, and maybe notifications, deadlines, things like that. We also have calendar. So when you have assignments, you, you can uh, see when the deadlines are, and things like that. And there is also a view um, with uh, assignments. I already have a few of them created because I was testing this demo earlier. Um, as you can see, there are currently four assignments for Rowdy. This contributor can only see Rowdy uh, assignments because it's only assigned to, 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 to them. Um, it already claimed two of them, and it didn't claim the other two. Okay, let's Probably this last one is the one that we just created. So this is the assignment page. Um, we, we can read what it's about. We can see deadlines, which content types are available. Um, and then we can claim it. And we are automatically redirected to the basically the know, know that page. But it filters out all the content types that are not relevant for this specific assignment. Um, and if you go directly to node add page, not going through the assignment, you will get access denied, because you always have to bring reference to the assignment with you. Um, so this is, these are assignments. Uh, another interesting thing is suggesting assignments. It's a very simple form. Um, it allows contributors to suggest what could be, what kind of content could be created. And it's basically the same form as uh, the assignment form that I used previously as editor to create it. But as you can see, there is a like, lot less fields on it. Uh, and the way that we do that, it's entity form display mode. Like in Drupal 7, you have this view mode thing 
to create like full content view, teaser view, search result view. Now in Drupal 8, you can do the same with forms. You can have default form. It's the one that you've seen before. But you can also create other view modes, form modes. And this is suggest form mode. And it exposes just two fields. All the other fields are hidden. Um, and it's, it's amazing. Um, I will uh, report about the concert of Amy. That would be hard, though. Yeah, and suggestion was created. Later I will show you how that appears on the editorial side. Um, um, there, some things are pre-populated, some things are not. Okay, let's, let's see how that works. First, if we go to the assignments list, you see that this assignment didn't appear here because it's... Remember the, the state field that I showed you before? It's now set to suggested. And the only assignments that appear here are the ones that are set to active. Now, if you go back to editorial user, and I go to manage assignments view, these are all views. Um, I can see that it was created, and I can see that it's suggested. I can go edit it. Um, so it was pre-populated with suggested. I can set it to active. Um, deadline was not set, but it's also not required. Uh, and I think the workflow is already here. And now when I change this to active, if I return back to the contributor side, uh, I can see that Amy Winehouse concert report appeared here. So it's very nice. Uh, form modes are amazing. The only issue, though, is that when you create it, you actually cannot get to it without writing any code. So it won't just create a URL and you will be able to go there. You have to create your own route and then display it. I guess this might be something that Contrib could, could fix. Um, okay, now let's say that we're happy that our suggestion was accepted and we want to write for this. Um, and this is the creation form. This is the title. Uh, this is body. It should be WYSIWYG, but I don't know where it disappeared. So I couldn't figure it out previously. Sorry? Uh, ah. Sorry? It's like medium. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, CK editor. Yeah, a little with a few improvements, few plugins. Dragon, Dragon, Dragon can tell more about that if you want. How do you do that? Well, I, yeah, I thought you touched it. <laughs> Sorry, I can't answer that. I didn't do it. I should ask. Okay. No, it's CK editor, definitely. We we wanted we Yeah, we we wanted to stay with CK editor if possible cuz it's part of the core and it's easier to maintain. Um, okay, we have word count up here, um, and uh, media is down there. Uh, so let's atta attach a headline photo. Um, this is normal entity reference field. It's just themed to be in this panel. Um, and this is entity browser that uses inline form to create entities in, inside of it. Mm, okay, let's. Um, 
We have a few other fields. This is media entity, so it has a file field and a few other fields that we added. Um, and then when you attach it, entity browser closes, and you have this thumbnail here where you can remove it. And if there are more entities here, you can reorder them with drag and dropping. Um, this is entity browser with using integration with inline entity form to provide that form that you've seen. And this is field widget for entity reference that ships with entity browser and gives you this experience. Then we can create a slideshow. This is inline entity form, like standard inline entity form with entity browser inside of it. We're basically replacing the, in inline entity form, you have this use existing entity functionality. And by default, inline entity form gives you autocomplete field there. We swap that out and bring entity browser in, which means that we can use entity browser to browse um, current entities, but we can also use it to create them, which then means that the concept of use existing isn't very valid anymore, but um, this was the, the, the nicest way how you can do it. Um, and this functionality also comes with Entity Browser module. There is currently a sub-module inside of it, which if you enable it and you add a piece of third-party configuration to the form display configuration for that field, um, it will do that for you. There is no new configuration UI yet, though, which means that you have hack YAMLs if you want to achieve that. Um, and inside of Entity Browser, we have Drop Zone Uploader. It's the one that I mentioned before. Um, it allows me to upload many files in one step. And then when I submit this, Entity Browser sends reference to the entities back to inline entity form. An inline entity form um, displays it in its standard table. Like this is, looks pretty much the same as in Drupal 7. Um, teaming is a little bit broken, and I think that the main reason for that is resolution of this projector. Sorry? Thank you. And slideshow has slideshow items and the title of course. And I can also inline edit each individual entity. Um, one thing that we didn't solve yet, and we want to do it, of course, it's to add this other metadata as part of the upload. Um, and we will. We were thinking of either doing like multi-step entity browser widget after upload, which would display this entity forms one by one, or maybe using multi-form and do it in one page. But that's that's multi-form is not ported yet, and I don't know. I don't like it. Um, or maybe even we will decide that like for fields that are probably the same for every slide slideshow item, it would make sense to put a field below the drop zone upload and then to fill it there and it would copy to all the entities that are created. So this is something that we want to solve and I also want to solve that for the general media ecosystem. Um, so we are, we are thinking about that. So now I have all these entities here and I can save my slideshow, hopefully. Okay, what happened? Oh, okay, something happened. Uh, wait, okay, uh, refresh is, I don't know, something is tricky with my configuration here. So when I saved it, um, I, I went one level down, so this is, inline entity form again, but not displaying slideshow items. Instead of that, it displays slideshows, slideshow itself. Okay. Um, so now we created a slideshow. Then we can also add videos. We have integration with 
AOL, uh, so we can search through their database here. Um, and then we can preview. This will basically open another tab and preview this video. Or we can select a video. And then uh, it's put here. I don't know what happened with the thumbnail. Or if somebody wants to add a YouTube video, you can switch. This is, this is also Entity Browser. Um, and it has two widgets that can be used. One is search videos. Um, and the other one is adding a bad code. And this should probably theme the as tabs. But I don't know. It wasn't done yet. Um, so if I switch to this Entity Browser widget, um, I basically get the media entity form where I put in title and credits for the video and paste embed code or URL of a YouTube video. And then it will create it um, the same way as it created the AOL thingy that we searched for. Then we also uh, allow people to attach location information to the content. Um, we use Bing Maps for that, like mainly for the reason that we already have contract with them. And we created a widget, field widget, and field type for this. It's called Bing Maps API. It's a project on Drupal.org, and it basically gives you this. You can add a field to an entity and have this search tool. And then when you save it and you refresh it, you, you get a location like this. Um, that's it. Then on the left side, we have a few side panels. First one is information about assignments. So if contributor isn't sure about details, then they can get to the information about assignment here. We have text panel where we can tag stuff. Um, uh, we can uh, provide some more information about the content, what genre it is, what type it is, uh, if it's newsworthy or not. Uh, I think that that means that it goes to Google News, but I'm not sure. Um, and then they can save it, of course. They can see a kind of a preview. Um, we don't do the actual preview with the look and feel of the destination website, because that means that every time that any of the destination websites change design, we have to update that here. Um, we were already discussing how we could do that, maybe. But it was not, we decided it's not day one requirement. So we might think about it, but we'll see. There are many other things that are more important at the moment. Then if I notice that there is anything that it's not right in my content, I can fix it. And when I'm happy with it, I can say submit for review. And now as you can see, I cannot edit my content anymore because when it's in the review state. It shouldn't be changed because that can confuse the review process. And we also have like the comment section where you can communicate with your reviewer, with your editor. Um, and we have notifications attached to that. So now editor can get an email. Um, what's the time? Um, not yet. Not yet. Uh, we have some custom code, right, Primoz? You can tell more about that. But um, we started discussing that we might integrate with Jules. So I had a chat, chat about that with Fago already. Uh, no, we're not doing that. No, they, they get this content is delivered to the target website in a structured form. 
Like all, every, all of these fields are sent separately, and it's up to them to display it as they want. Like they need to do their theming part. No. There were also some requirements about that. Um, it's our chief architect is fighting against that because he thinks that, like, if we do that properly, the entity embed way, then we still rely on the destination side to to do this to actually handle the display. Um, but for the target websites where we don't have control on, like we, we are afraid that like things could be done in a way that it would mean broken content. So, but there are there are also people requiring these features. So we'll see. Maybe we will add it in the future. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So this is this is the problem that is solved in Drupal 8. It's called Entity Embed Module. It um, provides API for embedding any any entity, uh, any content entity, I believe, in the WYSIWYG. It gives you CK Editor widget, which opens a dialog where you can find your entity and then configure display how it's displayed. And then this gets into WYSIWYG, and it's not saved in the form of a rendered entity. It just uses custom Drupal entity tag with data attributes on it. It's like entity UUID and display configuration. And then you have text filter that converts this uh, custom tag to the actual rendered version of, of that entity. And I also started working on a patch to integrate Entity Browser with Entity Embed, which means that on the first step of this embedding workflow, you will be able to use any Entity Browser to, to upload your, what you want to embed or to select it from a view. Question. It's still in an iframe. Um, it turns out that it's the most robust way, especially with complicated widgets as views where you can have uh, filters and, and pagers and, and like it's, it's the most secure way that everything works, unfortunately. Yeah, so you can, you can display Entity Browser in a model, but... This summer, first we tried to do it natively, but then this summer we decided that we will just display the in-frame inside of the dialog because we had so many problems and we just wanted it to work for people. So yeah, Entity Embed is a great module. And it's probably one of the most ready modules for Drupal 8 media in general because we had two Summer of Code projects on it. So it's great. Um, Okay, sorry, what's the time? Oh, I'm out of time, I guess. Yeah. Okay, uh, da -da uh, I will just show you how this looks on the editorial uh, side. Um, if we go to review queue, we see that this content appears here. It needs review. We can check it out. Um, we can respond to the comment, um, and we have review tool where you can uh, basically change some metadata about the content and change the workflow position. And if you reject it or uh, request rework, then it goes back to the contributor. And if you approve it, it basically goes into the queue for pushing to the target site. Um, and this is actually node edit form. So these are fields on a node, and we're again using form display 
like different form display than the default one. Um, and I guess this is more or less it, because we're out of time. Are there any other questions? It's custom for now. Custom for now, and this is also one of the things that we want to, uh, where we want to switch to, um, to Contrib solution when it's there. Uh, well, what we learned, uh, it was fun. Drupal 8 is more ready than you th might think. So you should definitely try it. And it's big fun for developers. Um, and you all know how hard it is to find good developers nowadays, uh, which, is, which means that this is a very beneficial thing. Um, where did I put that? Yeah, I thought I added slide, um, but it somehow disappeared. Uh, well, so I, a few weeks ago, I wrote, wrote a blog post uh, which basically tries to explain the current state of media, listing all the modules that are currently there with few screencasts that demo what is currently possible. Um, I will tweet it. I tweeted it yesterday, and Christoph tweeted it today. Um, it's basically on my blog. If you go to this URL, janusoreos.name, um, it's first post on the timeline. So if you are interested into more details about media and Drupal 8, uh, it's a great resource to start with. Um, and that's it. If you don't have, do you have any more questions? No. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. I would, I would really like to get some feedback. If you like the session, let me know, tweet me, or if, if there is anything that you didn't like, also let me know, because that way I can improve it next time. <laughs>